just give the carburetor a, a touch to draw the petrol through. My next operation after that is to turn on the 12 oilers for the total loss oiling system. Now the most important job of all, having inserted the starting handle as you can obviously see in the side of the engine, is to put it on half compression, otherwise there's a great risk of breaking your wrist. Turn on the switch, adjust the throttle and ignition controls, just tricky to get it going. There are two levers controlling the fuel and ignition that have to be skillfully adjusted as you drive along. One false move and the thing stalls. Also, the engine's very inefficient by today's standards, only doing about 12 miles to the gallon. And the total loss oiling system leaves a trail of oil along the ground wherever it goes. Engines haven't changed radically since this time, but their design has been continuously refined. Arguably the biggest single improvement has been in the oil and how the engine puts it to use. An engine wouldn't last for long without oil. The oil's fed through holes in the castings to all the bearings. There's actually an enormous amount of oil being pumped round all the time. I can show you this if I knock a hole in the oil filter. It's maybe a bit messy. The oil doesn't just lubricate, it all gets rather black and filthy like this, but it's also a detergent. It cleans up the deposits left by the exploding gases. Before this detergent was added in the 1940s, you had to strip down the engine and clean everything out or decoke it every few thousand miles. Now you just have to change the oil and the filter. I'm going to turn it off, actually. Whoops. <laughs> Many of the improvements in oil and petrol have been made possible by more sophisticated refining of the crude oil. Today, almost everything a refinery produces can be used by the car industry. Besides petrol and oil, it provides the chemicals which are the basis of plastics, paints and synthetic rubbers, and even the bitumen that the roads are made of. Gasoline. Liquid power to run millions of automobiles everywhere. Yet, how many know what happens to the gas after it is poured into the gas tanks? Or realize the care that motor car engineers have taken to give each drop an equal chance to do its duty. Gasoline is powerful, but each drop can give a 100% account of himself only when he finds the most efficiently designed gasoline system to help him along his journey. For a successful life, every drop of gasoline depends entirely upon what happens to him after he gets in the swim. First, the fuel has to be mixed with air. The air comes in through the large air filter on top of the engine, and it's mixed with the fuel inside the carburetor. It's easiest to see the uh, principle of the carburetor with this model. We've uh, used a vacuum cleaner to represent the engine because it's sucking in air all the time. It simply sucks the fuel up and mix up this little tube and mixes it with the air in here. Here we're going to use red ink instead of uh, petrol so that you can see it more clearly. Petrol by itself isn't explosive, only the mixture of petrol vapour and oxygen from the air. You can see the petrol being sucked in, looking down a real carburetor. I 
Unfortunately, real engines need different concentrations of fuel for different conditions, starting, idling, accelerating, etc. That's why the 1902 Woolsey had the mixture lever on the steering wheel. Modern carburetors make all these adjustments automatically, but this is why they're so fiendishly complicated. Today, a completely different system, fuel injection, is becoming more common. It's basically very simple. There's just a row of electric valves, one for each cylinder, that squirt a bit of petrol into each inlet. The precise length of time the valve opens, controlled by a computer, varies the amount of fuel injected very accurately. Once the fuel and air has been sucked into the cylinder and squashed up, it's ignited. The spark's created by a high voltage jumping across a gap in the spark plug. The high voltage itself is created by the coil connected to the battery. Engines don't like getting wet because water provides an easier path for the electricity than jumping across the gap, which I think I can show you. Put the spark out. Fortunately, though, you can often get the spark back again simply with a water-repelling oil. Although the ignition should be started by the spark, petrol is a complicated mixture of chemicals, some of which are quite unstable. These can ignite spontaneously under heat and pressure, causing a sort of uneven explosion called detonation or knock. As engines have become more powerful over the years, knock has become more of a problem. It can be overcome either by damping the unstable compounds with lead additives or in lead-free petrol by refining the unstable compounds out. The other option used in diesel engines is to refine the fuel less and to compress it more. The more the fuel squashed up in the cylinder, the hotter it gets. It can get so hot that it ignites spontaneously without any spark. We've blocked the bottom of this cylinder up completely and uh, cut a hole in it. Um, and if I put a bit of fuel in the side here and bash the piston down with a hammer, it should ignite. If I blow out the burnt gases, there may be enough fuel left to make it work a second time. It was a Victorian cigar lighter working on this principle that inspired Rudolf Diesel to design his first engine in the 1890s. Diesel believed that more compression would make his engine much more efficient. Mm. If this may have of a better future, Machines will free mankind from slavery of work. The higher compression made the engine more dangerous, and a prototype nearly killed him. What? He killed me! By 1895, though, Diesel had a design which ran on cheap fuel and was twice as efficient as any other engine of its time. Diesel became a millionaire from his invention, but invested very badly, quickly getting heavily into debt, and decided he couldn't carry on. Ah, oh, my God! I cannot pay this! In May 1913, he set off on a night ferry to Britain. I go. Goodbye. He was never seen again. <laughs>